So hopefully most of this will be a little bit of a review of Gen Chem. Gen Chem. And a little bit of organic. A lot of calculations today. So hopefully you've read chapter one already. on over the elemental analysis of how to find the molecular formula. That's going to be key to being able to then interpret spectra so that you can have a starting point in terms of a molecular formula. A couple of announcements. So we have our first chem night coming up next week. It's going to be on Wednesday at 7.30 to 9. And you can etch your Valentine A heart in the chemistry lab. I think it's in 43. And so if you remember the Jim Kim uh, lab where you were etching, I don't know if did that one, but you can etch metals. So we're going to do that with you first. I should do that for questions. Next Wednesday we will have a quiz, and then next Friday there will be homework due. Get that posted on Monday. Um, and then also the Whitworth Summer Research Programs are posted now, so if you're interested in trying to do a summer research, the applications are up. Um, and it lists who all is doing research within chemistry, it's in the doctoral and so on and such. logarithmic. So it takes that transmittance signal and it converts it to a logarithmic fashion to the absorbance. So if you look and just compare the general peaks here, the ketone or carbonyl peak <coughs> is still very strong. But the smaller peaks are a little bit stronger than they are in the absorbance. So you can, or in the transmittance, excuse me. So you can see those smaller peaks a little bit more clearly. We'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about IR in two weeks. But I just wanted to clarify that point. Okay, questions? So we are going to look at how to determine our molecular formula, and we're going to start with looking at elemental analysis. So elemental analysis is going to tell you exactly what element you have and what percentage of your sample in each element takes up. And we are going to assume, if we're working with organic compounds, that you are going to have, um, assume that we are going to have carbon and hydrogen in our sample. That's the standard 
assumption when you're starting out. Some of the other elements that we might see could be nitrogen or oxygen or whether the halogens. And we need a method for determining what we have there. One of the very older methods, this is um, from a long time ago. It's not really one we use a lot now because we use more instrumentation. But you would do a sodium fusion test. You take your sample and you take molten sodium metal. So you put a little bit of sodium metal in a test tube and you melt it with a Bunsen burner. Its melting point is about 98 degrees Celsius. Then you take your sample and you either add a few milligrams of the solid or a couple drops of the liquid. And if you do it right, you shouldn't see a flash or a small explosion when your compound reacts with the molten sodium. When you add your unknown, it's going to react with the sodium metal. You're going to get out some salts, so you're going to get out sodium cyanide, which would indicate the presence of nitrogen. <coughs> sodium <coughs> sulfide, and then sodium halides. You'll get salts of uh, sodium cyanide, Na2S, or sodium halogen, so chlorine, bromine, iodine. That's one hiking over there. You're going to get just a mixture of all of these, though, so you have to determine which ones are in the mixture, and you have to do further chemical tests to determine that. So they add water, and then you do some qualitative tests to determine which of these solids we have. So if we have sodium cyanide, we're going to add some iron. Ammonium sulfate. Actually, so you add those together and you get out an iron complex. and this will turn a blue color in solution. So you would look for the change in color. If we have the sulfide in solution, you're going to test for that by adding some lead to the mixture. So we're going to add lead, acetate, And if there is sulfur in the mixture, you're going to get lead sulfide, and that is going to be a black solid. That will be <coughs> out of solution. And can anybody guess how we're going to look for the halogen? That one would form a solid silver. So if we have a sodium halogen and we add silver nitrate, which is a soluble, water soluble silver complex, it forms silver halogen solid as a precipitate. Then you'd have to determine which halogen ion you have um, from other methods. You can see that this takes a lot of time and you're using so molten sodium which can be rather dangerous to work with. So this is the way they used to do it. Nowadays we use more interpretation of the mass spec which we'll get into when we talk about mass spec, which we've seen already in organic chemistry. After 
you have a general idea of what elements you have, so you will know where the, you have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, or the halogens, then you can do combustion analysis. There actually is no method to qualitatively determine if there's oxygen in your sample. And so if you need to, we just do subtraction after the fact with our percent analysis, or percent combustion numbers and <coughs> determine whether there was oxygen or not. The quantitative per portion of this is going to be our combustion analysis. So you're going to look for the relative amounts of each element. We know we have some carbon, but we don't know what percentage of the compound is carbon. And so that's where the combustion analysis comes in. to take your sample and you're going to inject it on an instrument. Well, actually, you won't be doing this. Usually we send this off to labs to do this because it takes very specific and highly calibrated instrumentation to get really good results out of this. So you inject your sample onto the column <coughs> or into the combustion chamber. The combustion chamber is going to burn up your sample. And that is going to generate, I guess I should say, in the presence of oxygen gas, it's going to generate carbon dioxide, water, and then if you have any of the sulfur or nitrogen, we're going to look probably at sulfur dioxide. The nitrogen might be looked at as some type of nitrogen oxide, but they can form a lot of nitrogen, different nitrogen oxides. So a lot of times that's then converted to into gas. So after you burn your compound in the combustion chamber, you get all of these different gases out. Then we're going to analyze the gases on what's essentially a GC mass spec. So you're going to send the sample through the GC. That's going to separate out the different gases. And then we will have a detection system at the end here that's going to look for the different peaks at the known retention times. And you're going to quantitate how much carbon dioxide is formed, how much water is formed, how much sulfur dioxide if you have any, and then the nitrogen gas as well. Again, this method is not finding how much oxygen was in your original sample, because that's what we're using to burn our sample. And we will use just inference to decide whether we had oxygen there or not. The last point here, warning, if you are making a sample in the lab, it needs to be almost 100% pure to get good combustion results. If you had, say, 5% solvent in your sample, that's going to add whatever your solvent is, say it was hexane. You're going to add carbon and hydrogen, and that's going to throw off your ratios. And these ratios are pretty particular, and the analysis is pretty difficult. And if you want to get really good samples, you have to have really pure stuff. This is one reason why it's not used as much anymore. I will admit that I did not do a single combustion analysis on my compounds I made in my PhD. And I made probably hundreds. So I'm glad I didn't have to because it's really hard to get rid of solvent. Even a little bit can throw off your results. But we do need to know how to do the calculations. And so we're going to start with just the raw data and then to show you how the numbers come across. And then after that, we're going to probably just start with the percentages that come out of your sample. And those will be the ones you're usually calculating from. But let's say we have an unknown that we take 
and do combustion analysis. We take 2.175 grams of the amino. This is going to be an amino acid. Give you a little hint of the types of things we're going to see. So that's our unknown. And we get 3.94 grams carbon dioxide and 1.89 grams water. In this analysis, they actually did a separate analysis to determine the nitrogen content of the sample. And so they took 1.873 grams of the unknown <coughs> and generated ammonia. Here now it's an NH2, I should say. And one point, or 0 0.411 grams of the NH2 from that 1.873 grams of your unknown. This is the raw data you would get out in the old method of doing this. <laughs> Typically, if you're doing combustion analysis these days, you're going to be sending your compound through the GC and the computer is going to do all the calculations for you in terms of percent. But where do those percentages come from? That's what we want to calculate now. So we have a mass of carbon dioxide, but we want to know how much carbon was in the original sample. And so we have to do conversions here. So we're going to start with our 3.94 grams of carbon dioxide. And we are going to convert that into grams of carbon in the original sample. So 3.494 grams of carbon dioxide. The molecular weight of carbon dioxide is 44.01 grams of carbon dioxide, or one mole of carbon dioxide. Then we need one mole of carbon dioxide is one mole of carbon, <coughs> and one mole of carbon atoms have, would have a mass of 12.00 grams of carbon. I'll do this, I already did the calculation, but we should end up with zero, 1.075 grams of carbon. We have to do the same thing for the hydrogen and the nitrogen. So we start with 1.89 grams of water and 18.02 grams of water in one mole of water, one mole of water is two moles of hydrogen. And then one mole of hydrogen is 1.008 grams of hydrogen from the molecular weight of hydrogen. that should give you 2.11 grams of zero. Yeah. 
second one mole of nitrogen is 14.01 grams of nitrogen. And that would give us 0.3959 grams of nitrogen. Now we have to take those grams. This is telling us that there was 1.075 grams of carbon in our 2.175 grams of the unknown compound. So we want to get some percentages out. And that's how they get the percent composition of your sample. So for carbon, we've got 1.075 grams of carbon and 2.175 grams of your unknown. And we want this as a percent, so we'll multiply that by 100 and get 49.4% carbon. You have to make these smaller to make them all fit. Hydrogen is going to be our 0 0.211 grams of hydrogen divided by 1.75 grams of the unknown times 100 should give us 9.7% hydrogen, nitrogen, 0 0.3. 5, 9 grams of nitrogen. Because okay, you have to pay attention to what number I use here, which is not the same unknown because that's not where, where we got the amount of nitrogen from. Our unknown uh, mass for our nitrogen is our one point seven three grams of the unknown. So we're going to get out nineteen point one seven percent nitrogen. So what does that add up to? About eighty. So our nitrogen plus carbon plus hydrogen adds up to 78.27. If that was all we had in our sample, it would add up to 100%. But we do have something else in our sample because we have some oxygen. So the oxygen is going to be 100% minus <coughs> this total of all the others, 78.27. Of the rest. So total of nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen. Which will give us 20, 21.7% oxygen. Like I said, most of these calculations will come to you directly. You won't have to do the calculation, this part of the calculation. However, you may have to then convert this number into the molecular formula. Or I should say the empirical formula, because this only gives you the empirical formula. So we're going to take those numbers, do a little bit more math. We're going to assume that we have 100 grams of sample. And if we have 100 grams of sample, that means that we would have 49.4 grams of carbon, 9.7 grams of hydrogen, 19.17 grams of 
nitrogen and 21.7 grams of oxygen. And then we're going to convert those into moles. Again. So, look on here. 49.4 grams of carbon, 12.01 grams of carbon, one mole of carbon. That should give us 4.811 moles of carbon. Hydrogen is going to be 9.7 grams of hydrogen. 1.008 grams of hydrogen, one mole of hydrogen. It's going to give us 9.6 moles of hydrogen. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. It's going to be 19.2 grams of nitrogen. 14.01 grams of nitrogen in one mole nitrogen, which would be 1.37 moles of nitrogen and our oxygen is going to be the 21.7 grams of oxygen and 16.00 grams for one mole of oxygen. 1.35 moles Oxygen. So now we know our ratio of carbon to hydrogen to nitrogen. So our ratio is 1.35 to 1.37. Not sounding exactly like molecular formula yet, because we like whole numbers of atoms in our molecules. And so we're just going to divide these by the smallest of them, which is the 1.35. Empirical formula has the lowest ratios of subscripts, whereas molecular formula is what's actually in the atom. Right. So, empirical formula will be the lowest ratio of all the different atoms, but it may not be the molecular formula, which may have any multiple of that, those numbers. We'll get to that in a second. <coughs> something with an acidic hydrogen, 
you can do some titrations of it. You have to know that you only have one or that you have two or something in order to get that method to work. Again, those are all the old methods that we don't tend to use anymore because mass spectrometry is a lot easier and more accurate. And so we take mass spectrometry, you take your sample and inject it into the mass spectrometer. It ionizes it and it gives us that mass to charge ratio. going to be a, a single isotopic combination, so it's only looking at one isotope, and that's when we have all those ratios, or sorry, all our molecular masses that come out to 1.008 or 14.01, oh, 14 remember that that's the average of all the isotopes. But we will get our molecular ion. And then we can know our molecular mass. So it turns out that for this sample, the molecular mass is 146 grams per mole. What is the molecular mass of our formula? Yeah, so if, let's say we uh, did the uh, mass spec, 
we could determine that the molecular mass was 146. You would be given that information. Okay. okay. There's a couple other things we want to be able to do with our molecular formulas. Once we get a molecular formula, we want to determine the index of hydrogen deficiency, U. In organic chemistry, I call it the units of unsaturation, so same thing. And they'll be calculated in a similar way. So this gives you the information about the number of multiple bonds or cyclic structures in your molecule, in, or cyclo alkene. Under information, we do the number of multiple bonds plus rings in a given formula. The basic formula is C, N, so N number of carbons, and then you have your hydrogen. If we had just a completely saturated carbon-hydrogen molecule, it would be 2N plus 2 for the number of hydrogens, but then we have to adjust that for the number of heteroatoms that may be included in that molecule. Again, heteroatoms refers to any atom or element that is not carbon or hydrogen. I have simplified this down, uh, but your text goes into the reason why. The number of nitrogens, if you have a nitrogen, you're going to add one for every nitrogen you have to your maximum number of hydrogens in a saturated structure. Then if you have a number of any number of halogens, you're going to subtract one. Basically, the halogen is going to have to replace one of the hydrogens, so you have to take one away. And this formula is going to give you the maximum number of hydrogens that could be accommodated by that many carbons in this structure. So we've got the 2n plus 2 plus the number of nitrogens minus the number of halogens. We then take that number and you take the maximum number of hydrogens and you subtract out how many hydrogens you actually have in your formula and divide by two and that will tell you the units of unsaturation or your hydrogen deficiency. That tells us how many multiple bonds or rings you have in your structure. This works best if we just go through several examples. So let's start with our original structure there, or molecular formula we've been looking at, C6H14N2O2. Carbon, so we have six carbons here. So in our maximum number of hydrogens, we're going to have two times six plus two, so for our 2n plus two, then we need to add two for every nitrogen, and we would subtract for every halogen. Oxygen, we just ignore, because oxygen can go in between a carbon and a hydrogen without adding any other hydrogens or taking any away. And so we get this for our maximum number of hydrogens, 2 times 6 would be 12, 14, 16. So we have H16, N2O2. So then we have C6, H14, N2O2 in our actual formula. So this is the max <coughs> H's formula. subtract those out, we're going to end up with two hydrogens. We divide that by two and we get one unit of hydrogen deficiency. So I got a couple practice 
ones for you to do. I'll erase all this madness. <laughs> One of them you're going to have to make some analogies in order to solve it. So C7H5Cl. <laughs> so go ahead and work with your neighbors, come up with some units of unsaturation or hydrogen deficiency for each of those forms of formulas. so far. Yeah. What do I do with this last one? So we treat it like nitrogen and oxygen. They all act just like the ones by both. So phosphorus we treat like nitrogen. Oxygen or sulfur we treat like oxygen. And bromine is a halogen. So we take our two and six plus two. Minus one for the halogen, plus one. For the phosphorus, sulfur we ignore and get 12, 15, no, 12, 14. So our C6, H14, BRPS, C6. Four hydrogens with a 
two, two units non saturation. And we can use phosphorus like nitrogen because it bonds in the same way. It still wants to have three bonds right. in one okay. pair of electrons in its normal state. We won't talk about expanded optics. <laughs> um, so it works the same way nitrogen does. Sulfur is the same thing. So another question? Any other questions? Okay, so the last part that we're going to talk about is the new part, which is the rule of 13. This is really useful when you're starting from scratch. And let's say you're given a molecular mass, you're not given percent composition or anything else, you're just given one number, and you want to try and figure out what the molecular formula is. You may have encountered this problem in OCHEM, and you start randomly scribbling down numbers of carbons and hydrogen <laughs> that might fit within the equation, right? Well, here's a slightly easier starting point. So let's assume that we are looking at organic molecules, like we are in this uh, textbook. Your basic organic subunit is going to be a carbon with a hydrogen. This is as far down as we can get. So what would the mass of one carbon and one hydrogen added together be? 13. Oh, 13. Here's where our rule of 13 comes from. Assuming that we only have carbon and hydrogen in our structure, then we are going to use that and we can adjust it to add other elements in by 
by taking away some carbons and some hydrogens to make up the difference in the mass. And it, there's a table in your textbook here. It's reproduced. So if you have an oxygen, oxygen has molecular weight of 16. So you would take away one carbon, which has a molecular weight of 12, plus four hydrogens to add up to the 16. So if we're going to add an oxygen <laughs> to this, we're going to say C11. Let's go 
going to be 6 minus 9 plus 2, 9 by 2. So we have 31 and a half. Is it negative 1 and a half? Negative 1? Yeah, negative 1 and a half. We know that this formula does not work because it's got a negative half in its unsaturation. So then we have to adjust the formula to make it work. And so you always want to check your units of unsaturation for every one you're doing so that you know that it's a real formula and you can cross off the ones that have either negative or halves or both in this case. And so we're going to adjust this. A, high, a nitrogen, look the way to 14, is going to take away one carbon and two hydrogens. And you get C5H13N. <coughs> and that's why we add one half for a unit of unsaturation for nitrogen. And in that case, we end up with a unit of unsaturation of zero, which is an OK number. Um, one more thing. Do you remember all the way back? Odd molecular mass is something that indicates to us that there should be nitrogen in the molecule. So. All right, oh, yeah. more examples to come. We will start going over.